Hello dear readers, since we are close to the end of the book, I kind of feel like I can guess how it's going to end. I feel like she's gonna pick her original root life, but let's read and find out. Love and Pain I hate this process, Nora told Mrs. Elm with real force in her voice. I want it to stop. Please be quiet, said Mrs. Elm with a white knife in her hand, concentrating on her move. This is a library. We're the only two people here. That's not the point. It is still a library. If you are in a cathedral, you are quiet because you are in a cathedral, not because other people are there. It's the same with the library. Okay, Nora said in a lower voice. I don't like this. I want it to stop. I want to cancel my membership of the library. I would like to hand in my library card. You are the library card. Nora returned to her original point. I want it to stop. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Then why are you still here? Because I have no choice. Trust me, Nora. If you really didn't want to be here, you wouldn't be here. I told you this right at the start. I don't like it. Why? Because it's too painful. Why is it painful? Because it's real. In one life, my brother is dead. The librarian's face became stern again. And in one life, one of his lives, you are dead. Will that be painful for him? I doubt it. He doesn't want anything to do with me these days. He has his own life and he blames me that it is unfulfilled. So, this is all about your brother? No, it's about everything. It seems impossible to live without hurting people. That's because it is. So, why live at all? Well, in fairness, dying hurts people too. Now, what life do you want to choose next? I don't. What? I don't want another book. I don't want another life. Mrs. Elm's face went pale, like it had done all those years ago when she got the call about Nora's dad. Nora felt a trembling beneath her feet, a minor earthquake. She and Mrs. Elm held on to the shelves as books fell to the floor. The lights flickered and then went dark completely. The chessboard and table tipped over. Oh no, said Mrs. Elm. Not again. What's the matter? You know what the matter is. This whole place exists because of you. You are the power source. When there is a severe disruption in the power source, the library is in jeopardy. It's you, Nora. You're giving up at the worst possible moment. You can't give up, Nora. You have more to offer, more opportunities to have. There are so many versions of you out there. Remember how you felt after the polar bear? Remember how much you wanted life? The polar bear, the polar bear. Even these bad experiences are serving a purpose, don't you see? She saw. The regrets she had been living with most of her life were wasted ones. Yes, the minor earthquake subsided, but there were books scattered everywhere, all over the floor. The lights had come back on, but it still flickered. I'm sorry, said Nora. She started trying to pick up the books and put them back in place. No, snapped Mrs. Elm. Don't touch them. Put them down. Sorry. And stop saying sorry. Now you can help me with this. This is safer. She helped Mrs. Elm pick up the chess pieces and set up the board for a new game, putting the table back in place too. What about all the books on the floor? Are we just going to leave them? Why do you care? I thought you wanted them to disappear completely. Mrs. Elm may well have just been a mechanism that existed in order to simplify the intricate complexity of the quantum universe. But right now, sitting down between the half-empty bookshelves near her chessboard, set up for a new game, she looked sad and wise and infinitely human. I didn't mean to be so harsh, Mrs. Elm managed eventually. That's okay. I remember when we started playing chess in the school library. You used to lose your best players straight away, she said. You'd go and get the queen or the rooks right out there, and they'd be gone. And then you would act like the game was lost because you were just left with pawns and a knight or two. Why are you mentioning this now? Mrs. Elm saw a loose thread on her cardigan and tucked it inside her sleeve, then decided against it and let it loose again. 
You need to realize something if you are ever to succeed at chess," she said, as if Nora had nothing bigger to think about. And the thing you need to realize is this: the game is never over until it is over. It isn't over if there is a single pawn is still on the board. If one side is down to a pawn and a king, and the other side has every player, there is still a game. And even if you were a pawn, maybe we all are, then you should remember that a pawn is the most magical piece of all. It might look small and ordinary, but it isn't, because a pawn is never just a pawn. A pawn is a queen in waiting. All you need to do is find a way to keep moving forward, one square after another, and you can get to the other side and unlock all kinds of power. Nora stared at the books around her. So you're saying I only have pawns to play with? I am saying that the thing that looks the most ordinary might end up being the thing that leads you to victory. You need to keep going, like that day in the river. Do you remember? Of course she remembered. How old had she been? Must have been seventeen, as she was no longer swimming in competitions. It was a fraught period in which her dad was cross with her all the time, and her mom was going through one of her near mute depression patches. Her brother was back from art college for the weekend with Ravi, showing his friend the sights of glorious Bedford. Joe had arranged an impromptu party by the river, with music and beer and a ton of weed, and girls who were frustrated Joe wasn't interested in them. Nora had been invited and drank too much, and somehow got talking to Ravi about swimming. So, could you swim the river? He asked her. Sure. No, you couldn't. Someone else had said. And so, in a moment of idiocy, she had decided to prove them wrong. And by the time her stoned and heavily inebriated older brother realized what she was doing, it was too late. The swim was well underway. As she remembered this, the corridor at the end of the aisle in the library turned from stone to flowing water. The tiles beneath her feet now sprouted grass, and the ceiling above her became sky. But unlike when she disappeared into another version of the present, Mrs. Elm and the books remained. She was half in the library and half inside the memory. She was staring at someone in the corridor river. It was her younger self in the water, as the last of the summer light dissolved towards dark. Equidistant, the river was cold and the current is strong. She remembered as she watched herself. The aches in her shoulder and arms, the stiff heaviness of them, as if she'd been wearing armor. She remembered not understanding why, for all that effort, the silhouette of the sycamore trees stubbornly stayed the same size, just as the bank stayed exactly the same distance away. She remembered swallowing some of the dirty water and looking around at the other bank, the bank from where she had come and the place where she was kind of now standing. Watching, along with that younger version of her brother and his friends beside her, obvious to her present self and to the bookshelves on either side of them, she remembered now in her delirium she had thought of the word equidistant, a word that belonged in the clinical safety of a classroom. Equidistant, such a neutral mathematical kind of word, and one that became a stuck thought. Repeating itself like a manic meditation, as she used the last of her strength to stay almost exactly where she was, equidistant, 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 not aligned to one bank or the other. That was how she felt most of her life, caught in the middle, struggling, flailing, just trying to survive while not knowing which way to go, which path to commit to without regret. She looked at the bank on the other side, now with added bookshelves, but still with the large silhouette of a sycamore tree leaning over the water like a worried parent, the wind shushing through its leaves. But you did commit," said Mrs. Elm, evidently having heard Nora's thoughts, "and you survived. Someone else's dream. Life is always an act." Mrs. Elm said as they watched her brother being pulled back from the water's edge by his friends, as he then watched the girl whose name she'd long forgotten make an emergency call, and you acted when it counted. You swam to that bank. 
you clawed yourself out. You coughed your guts out and had hyperthermia. But you crossed the river. Against the incredible odds, you found something inside you. Yes, bacteria. I was ill for weeks. I swallowed so much of that shitty water. But you lived. You had hope. Yes, well, I was losing it by the day. She stared down to see the grass shrink back into the stone and looked back to catch the last sight of the water before it shimmered away. And the sycamore tree dissolved into air along with her brother and his friends and her own young self. The library looked exactly like the library again, but now the books were all back onto the shelves and the lights had stopped flickering. I was so stupid doing that swim, just trying to impress people. I always thought Joe was better than me. I wanted him to like me. Why did you think he was better than you? Because your parents did? Nora felt angry at Mrs. Elm's directness, but maybe she had a point. I always had to do what they wanted me to do in order to impress them. Joe had his issues, obviously, and I didn't really understand those issues until I knew he was gay. But they say sibling rivalry isn't about siblings, but parents. And I always felt my parents just encouraged his dreams a bit more. Like music? Yeah. When he and Robbie decided they wanted to be rock stars, mom and dad bought Joe a guitar and then an electric piano. How did that go? The guitar bit went well. He could play Smoke on the Water within a week of getting it. But he wasn't into the piano and decided he didn't want it cluttering up his room. And that's when you got it. Mrs. Elm said this as a statement rather than a question. She knew, of course, she knew. Yeah. It was moved into your room, and you welcomed it like a friend, and started learning to play it with a steadfast determination. You spent your pocket money on piano teaching guides, and Mozart for beginners, and the Beatles for piano, because you liked it, but also because you wanted to impress your older brother. I never told you all this. A wry smile. Don't worry, I read the book. Right, of course, yeah, got you. You might need to stop worrying about other people's approval, Nora. Mrs. Elm said in a whisper for added power and intimacy, you don't need a permission slip to be your... Yes, I get it. And she did get it. Every life she had tried so far since entering the library had really been someone else's dream. The married life in the pub had been Dan's dream. The trip to Australia had been Izzy's dream. And her regret about not going had been a guilt for her best friend more than a sorrow for herself. The dream of her becoming a swimming champion belonged to her father. And okay, so it was true that she had been interested in the Arctic and being a glaciologist when she was younger. But that had been steered quite significantly by her chats with Mrs. Elm herself back in the school library. And the labyrinth, well, that had always been her brother's dream. Maybe there was no perfect life for her, but somewhere, surely, there was a life worth living. And if she was to find a life truly worth living, she realized she would have to cast a wider net. Mrs. Elm was right. The game wasn't over. No player should give up if there were pieces still left on the board. She straightened her back and stood up tall. You need to choose more lives from the bottom or top shelves. You have been seeking to undo your most obvious regrets. The books on the higher and lower shelves are the lives a little bit further removed. Lives you are still living in one universe or another, but not ones you have been imagining or mourning or thinking about. They are lives you could live, but never dreamed of. So, they are unhappy lives? Some will be, some won't be. It's just they are not the most obvious lives. They are ones which might require a little imagination to reach. But I am sure you can get there. Can't you guide me? Mrs. Elm smiled. I could read you a poem. Librarians like poems. And then she coded Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a road, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. What if there are more than two roads diverging in the wood? What if there are more roads than trees? What if there is no end to the choices you could make? 
What would Robert Frost do then? She remembered studying Aristotle as a first-year philosophy student and being a bit depressed by his idea that excellence was never an accident, that excellent outcomes were the result of the wise choice of many alternatives. And there she was in the privileged position of being able to sample these many alternatives. It was a shortcut to wisdom and maybe a shortcut to happiness too. She saw it now not as a burden but a gift to be cherished. Look at that chessboard we put back in place, said Mrs. Elm softly. Look at how ordered and safe and peaceful it looks now, before a game starts. It's a beautiful thing, but it is boring, it is dead. And yet the moment you make a move on that board, things change. Things begin to get more chaotic. And that chaos builds with every single move you make. She took a seat at the chess table opposite Mrs. Elm. She stared down at the board and moved the pawn two spaces forward. Mrs. Elm mirrored the move on her side of the board. It is an easy game to play, she told Nora, but a hard one to master. Every move you make opens a whole new world of possibilities. Nora moved one of her knights. They progressed like this for a little while. Mrs. Elm provided a commentary. At the beginning of a game, there are no variations. There is only one way to set up a board. There are nine million variations after the first six moves. And after eight moves, there are 288 billion different positions. And those possibilities keep growing. There are more possible ways to play a game of chess than the amount of atoms in the observable universe. So it gets very messy. And there is no right way to play. There are many ways. In chess, as in life, possibility is the basis of everything. Every hope, every dream, every regret, every moment of living. By the way, what do you think about this Mrs. Elm voice I've been trying to do? I hope it's not annoying. Eventually, Nora won the game. She had a sneaky suspicion that Mrs. Elm had let her, but she still was feeling a bit better. Okie dokie, said Mrs. Elm. Now time for a book, I reckon. What do you say? Nora gazed along the bookshelves. If only they had more specific titles. If only there was one that said, perfect life right here. Her initial instinct had been to ignore Mrs. Elm's question. But where there were books... There was always the temptation to open them, and she realized it was the same with lives. Mrs. Elm repeated something she said earlier. Never underestimate the big importance of small things. This was useful, as it turned out. I want, she said, a gentle life. The life where I worked with animals. Where I chose the animal shelter job. Where I did my work experience at the school, over the one at the string theory. Yes, give me that one, please. A gentle life. It turned out that this particular existence was quite easy to slip into. The sleep was good in this life, and she didn't wake up until the alarm went off at a quarter to eight. She drove to work in a tatty old Hyundai that smelled of dogs and biscuits and was decorated with crumbs, passing the hospital and the sports center and pulling up in the small car park outside the modern, grey-bricked, single-story rescue center. She spent the morning feeding and walking the dogs. The reason it was quite easy to blend into this life was at least partly because she had been greeted by an affable, down-to-earth woman with brown, curly hair and a Yorkshire accent. The woman, Pauline, said Nora was to start work in a dog shelter rather than a cat shelter, and so Nora had a legitimate excuse to ask what to do and look confused. Also, the issue of knowing people's names was solved by the fact that all workers had name badges. Nora had walked a bull mastiff, a new arrival, around the field behind the shelter. Pauline told her that the bull mastiff had been horribly treated by its owner. She pointed out a few small round scars. Cigarette burns. Nora wanted to live in a world where no cruelty existed. But the only worlds she had available on her were worlds with humans in them. The bull mastiff was called Sally. She was scared of everything, her shadow, bushes, other dogs, Nora's legs, grass, 
air, though she clearly took a liking to Nora and even succumbed to a very quick tummy rub. Later, Nora helped clean out some of the little dog huts. She imagined they called them huts because it sounded better than cages, which was really a more apt name for them. There was a three-legged Alsatian called Diesel, who had been there a while apparently. When they played catch, Nora discovered his reflexes were good, his mouth catching the ball almost every time. She liked this life, or more precisely, she liked the version of herself in this life. She could tell the kind of person she was from the way people spoke to her. It felt nice, comforting, solidifying to be a good person. Her mind felt different here. She thought a lot in this life, but her thoughts were gentle. Compassion is the basis of morality. The philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer had written in one of his softer moments. Maybe it was the basis of life too. There was one man who worked there called Dylan, who had a natural way with all the dogs. He was about her age, maybe younger. He had a kind, gentle, sad look about him. His long, surf dude hair golden as a retriever. He came and sat next to Nora on a bench at lunch, overlooking the field. What are you having today? He asked, sweetly nodding to Nora's lunchbox. She honestly didn't know. She had found it already prepared when she'd opened her magnet and calendar cluttered fridge that morning. She peeled off the lid to find a cheese and marmite sandwich and a packet of salt and vinegar chips. The sky darkened and the wind picked up. Oh crap, Nora said. It's going to rain. Maybe, but the dogs are still in their cages. Sorry? Dogs can smell when rain is coming, so they often head indoors if they think it's going to happen. Isn't that cool? That they can predict the future with their nose. Yes, said Nora. Way cool. Nora bit into her cheese sandwich, and then Dylan put his arm around her. Nora jumped up. The hell? she said. Dylan looked deeply apologetic and a little horrified at himself. I'm sorry, did I hurt your shoulder? No, I just... I... No, no, it's fine. She discovered that Dylan was her boyfriend and that he had gone to the same secondary school as her, Hazel Dinkamp, and that he was two years younger. Nora could remember the day her dad died when she was in the school library staring as a blonde boy from a couple of years below ran past outside the rain speckled window either chasing someone or being chased. That had been him. She had vaguely liked him from a distance, but without really knowing him or thinking about him at all. You're right, Norster? Dylan asked. Norster? Yeah, I was just... Yeah, I'm fine. Nora sat down again, but left a bit more bench between them. There was nothing overtly wrong with Dylan. He was sweet, and she was sure that in this life, she genuinely liked him maybe even loved him, but entering a life wasn't the same as entering an emotion. By the way, did you book Gino's? Gino's, the Italian. Nora had gone there as a teenager. She was surprised it was still going. What? Gino's, the pizza place, for tonight? You said you kind of know the manager there. My dad used to, yeah. So, did you manage to call? Yes, she lied. But actually, it is fully booked. On a weeknight? weird. That's a shame. I love pizza and pasta and lasagna and... Right, said Nora. Yes, I get it. I completely get it. I know it was a strange, but they had a couple of big bookings. Dylan already had his phone out. He was eager. I'll try La Cantina. You know, the Mexican. Tons of vegan options. I love a Mexican, don't you? Nora couldn't think of a legitimate reason for her not to do this, Aside from Dylan's not entirely riveting conversation, and compared to the sandwich she was currently eating and the state of the rest of her fridge, Mexican food sounded promising. So Dylan booked them a table, and they carried on talking as dogs barked in the building behind them. It emerged during the conversation that they were thinking of moving in together. We could watch Last Chance Saloon, he said. She wasn't really listening. What's that? He was shy, she realized. Bad with eye contact, quite endearing. You know that Ryan Bailey film you wanted to watch? We saw the trailer for it. You said it's meant to be funny and I did some research and it has an 86% on Rotten Tomatoes and it's on Netflix, so... 
She wondered if Dylan would believe her if she told him that in one life she was a lead singer of an internationally successful pop rock band and a global icon who had actually dated and voluntarily broken up with Ryan Bailey. Sounds good, she said as she stared at an empty crisp packet floating across the sparse grass. Dylan rushed off the bench to grab the packet and dropped it into the bin next to the bench. He flopped back to Nora, smiling. Nora understood what this other Nora saw in him. There was something pure about him, like a dog himself. Why want another universe if this one has dogs? The restaurant was on Castle Road, around the corner from a string theory, and they had to walk past the shop to get there. The familiarity of it felt strange. When she reached the shop, she saw that something wasn't right. There were no guitars in the window. There was nothing in the window, except a faded piece of A4 paper stuck on the inside of the glass. She recognized Neil's handwriting. Alas, a string theory is no longer able to trade in these premises. Due to an increase in rent, we simply couldn't afford to go on. Thanks to all our loyal customers. Don't think twice. It's all right. You can go your own way. God only knows what will be without you. Dylan was amused. I see what they did there. Then a moment later, I was named after Bob Dylan. Did I ever tell you that? I can't remember. You know, the musician. Yes, I have heard of Bob Dylan, Dylan. My older sister is called Suzanne. After the Leonard Cohen song, Nora smiled. My parents loved Leonard Cohen. Ever been in there? Dylan asked her. Looked like a great shop. Once or twice. Thought you would have been. What with you being musical? You used to play the piano, didn't you? Used to. Yeah, keyboards, a little. Nora saw the notice looked old. She remembered what Neil had said to her. I can't pay you to put off customers with your face looking like a wet weekend. Well, Neil, maybe it wasn't my face after all. They carried on walking. Dylan, do you believe in parallel universes? He shrugged. I think so. What do you think you are doing in another life? Do you think this is a good universe? Or would you rather be in a universe where you left Bedford? Not really. I am happy here. Why want another universe if this one has dogs? Dogs are the same here as they are in London. I had a place, you know. I'd gotten to Glasgow University to do veterinary medicine. And I went for a week, but I missed my dogs too much. Then my dad lost his job and couldn't really afford for me to go. So, yeah, I never got to be a vet and I really wanted to be a vet. But I don't regret it. I have a good life. I've got some good friends. I've got my dogs. Nora smiled. She liked Dylan, even if she doubted she could be as attracted to him as this other Nora. He was a good person and good people were rare. As they reached the restaurant, they saw a tall, dark-haired man in the running gear jogging towards them. It took a disorienting moment for Nora to realize it was Ash. The Ash who had been a surgeon, the Ash who had been a customer at the String Theory and who had asked her out for coffee, the Ash who had comforted her in the hospital and who had knocked on her door in another world last night to tell her that Voltaire was dead. It seemed so recent, that memory, and yet it was hers alone. He was obviously doing some training for the half marathon on Sunday. There was no reason to believe that the ash in this life was any different from the one in her root life, except the chances were that he probably hadn't found a dead Voltaire last night. Or maybe he had, though Voltaire wouldn't have been called Voltaire. Hi, she said, forgetting which timeline she was in. And Ash smiled back at her, but it was a confused smile. Confused but kind, which somehow made Nora feel even more cringy, because of course in this life there had not been the knock on the door. There had never even been the asking for a coffee or the purchase of a Simon and Garfunkel songbook. Who was that? Dylan asked. Oh, just someone I knew in another life. Dylan was confused, but shook it away like rain. And then they were there. Dinner with Dylan. La Cantina had hardly changed in years. Nora had a flashback to the evening she had taken Dan there years ago on his first visit to Bedford. 
they'd sat at a table in a corner and had too many margaritas and talked about their joint future. It was the first time that Dan had expressed his dream of living in a pub in the country. They had been on the verge of moving in together, just as Nora and Dylan apparently were in this life. Now she remembered it. Dan had been pretty rude to the waiter, and Nora had overcompensated with excessive smiles. It was one of life's rules. Never trust someone who is willingly rude to low-paid service staff, and Dan had failed at that one, and many of the others. Although, Nora had to admit, La Cantina would not have been her top choice to return to. I love this place. Dylan said now, looking around at the busy, garish, red and yellow decor. Nora wondered, quietly, if there was any place Dylan didn't or wouldn't love. He seemed like he would be able to sit in a field near Chernobyl and marvel at the beautiful scenery. Over black bean tacos, they talked about dogs and a school. Dylan had been two years below Nora and remembered her primarily as the girl who was good at swimming. He even remembered the school assembly, which Nora had long tried to repress, where she had been called on a stage and given a certificate for being an exceptional representative of Hazel Dean Comp. That was possibly the moment Nora had begun to go off swimming, the moment she found it harder being with her friends, the moment she slunk away into the margins of a school life. I used to see you in the library during breaks, he said, smiling at the memory. I remember seeing you playing chess with that librarian we used to have. What was her name? Mrs. Elm, Nora said. That's it, Mrs. Elm. And then he said something even more startling. I saw her the other day. Did you? Yeah, she was on Shakespeare Road, with someone dressed in a uniform like a nurse's outfit. I think she was heading into the care home after a walk. She looked very frail, very old. For some reason, Nora had assumed Mrs. Elm had died years ago, and that the version of Mrs. Elm she always saw in the library had made that idea more likely, as the version was always the exact version she had been at the school, preserved in Nora's memory like a mosquito in amber. Oh no, poor Mrs. Elm. I loved her. Last Chance Saloon after meal, Nora went back to Dylan's house to watch the Ryan Bailey movie. They had a half-drunk bottle of wine that the restaurant let them take home. Her self-justification regarding going to Dylan's was that he was sweet and open and would reveal a lot about their life without having to pry too deep. He lived in a small terraced house on Huxley Avenue that he had inherited from his mom. The house was made even smaller by the amount of dogs there. There were five that Nora could see, though there may have been more lurking upstairs. Nora had always imagined she liked the smell of dog, but she suddenly realized there was a limit to this fondness. Sitting down on the sofa, she felt something hard beneath her, a plastic ring for the dogs to gnaw on. She put it on the carpet amid the other chew toys, the toy bone, the foam yellow ball with chunks bitten out of it, a half-massacred soft toy. A chihuahua with cataracts tried to have sex with her right leg. Stop that, Pedro, said Dylan, laughing, as he pulled the little creature away from her. Another dog, a giant meaty chestnut-colored Newfoundland, was sitting next to her on the sofa, licking Nora's ear with a tongue the size of a slipper, meaning that Dylan had to sit on the floor. Do you want the sofa? No, I'm fine on the floor. Nora didn't push it. In fact, she was quite relieved. It made it easier to watch Last Chance Saloon without any further awkwardness. And the newfound land stopped licking her ear and rested its head on her knee and Nora felt, well, not happy exactly, but not depressed either. And yet, as she watched Ryan Bailey tell his on-screen love interest that life is for living cupcake, while simultaneously being informed by Dylan that he was thinking of letting another dog sleep in his bed, he cries all night, he wants his daddy. Nora realized she wasn't too enamored with this life. And also, Dylan deserved the other Nora, the one who had managed to fall in love with him. This was a new feeling, as if she was taking someone's place. Realizing she had a high tolerance for alcohol in this life, she poured herself some more wine. It was a pretty rope Zinfandel from California. She stared at the label on the back, 
there was for some reason a mini co-autobiography of a woman and a man, Janine and Terence Thornton, who owned the vineyard which had made the wine. She read the last sentence. When we were first married, we always dreamed of opening our own vineyard one day, and now we have made that dream a reality. Here at Dry Creek Valley, our life tastes as good as a glass of Zinfandel. She stroked the large dog who'd been licking her and whispered the goodbye into the Newfoundland's wide, warm brow as she left Delenn and his dogs behind. Buena Vista Vineyard In the next visit to the Midnight Library, Mrs. Elm helped Nora find the life she could have lived that was closest to the life depicted on the label of that bottle of wine from that restaurant. So she gave Nora a book that sent her to America. In this life, Nora was called Nora Martinez, and she was married to a twinkle-eyed Mexican-American man in his early 40s called Eduardo, who she had met during the gap year she'd regretted never having after leaving university. After his parents had died in a boating accident, she had learned from a profile piece on them in the Wine Enthusiast magazine, which they had framed in their oaked panel tasting room, Eduardo had been left a modest inheritance and they bought a tiny vineyard in California. Within three years, they had done so well, particularly with their Serra varietals, that they were able to buy the neighboring vineyard when it came up for sale. Their winery was called the Buena Vista Vineyard, situated in the foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains, and they had a child called Alejandro who was at boarding school near Monterey Bay. Much of their business came from wine trail tourists. Coach loads of people arrived at hourly interval. It was quite easy to improvise, as the tourists were genuinely quite gullible. It went like this. Eduardo would decide which wines to put out in the glasses before each coach load arrived, and hand Nora the bottles. Whoa, Nora, this pasilla on poco too much. He reprimanded in his good-humored Spanglish when she was a bit too liberal with the measures. And then, when the tourists came, Nora would inhale the wines as they sipped and swelled them, and try to echo Eduardo and say the right things. There is a woodiness to the bouquet with this one. Or, you'll note the vegetal aromas here. The bright, robust blackberries and fragrant nectarine, perfectly balanced with the echoes of charcoal. Each life she had experienced had a different feeling, like different movements in a symphony, and this one felt quite bold and uplifting. Eduardo was incredibly sweet-natured, and their marriage seemed to be a successful one, maybe even one to rival the life of the couple on the wine label, of the bottle of Rupé wine she'd drunk with Delenn, while being licked by his astronomically large dog. She even remembered their names, Janine and Terence Thornton. She felt like she too was now living in a label on a bottle. She also looked like it, perfect Californian hair and expensive-looking teeth, tanned and healthy, despite the presumably quite substantial consumption of Syrah. She had the kind of flat, hard stomach that suggested hours of Pilates every week. However, it wasn't just easy to fake wine knowledge in this life, it was easy to fake everything, which could have been a sign that the key to her apparently successful union with Eduardo was that he wasn't really paying attention. After the last of the tourists left, Eduardo and Nora sat out under the stars with a glass of their own wine in their hands. The fire have died out in the LA now, he told Nora. Nora wondered who lived in the Los Angeles home she had in her pop star life. That's a relief. Yeah. Isn't it beautiful? She asked him, staring up at the clear sky full of constellations. What? The galaxy. Yes. He was on his phone and didn't say very much, and then he put his phone down and still didn't say much. She had known three types of silence in relationships. There was passive-aggressive silence, obviously. There was the we-no-longer-have-anything-to-say silence. And then there was the silence that Eduardo and she seemed to have cultivated. The silence of not needing to talk, or just being together, of together being the way you could be happily silent with yourself. But still, she wanted to talk. We're happy, aren't we? Why the question? Oh, uh, I know we're happy. I just like to hear you say it sometimes. We're happy, Nora. She sipped her wine and looked at her husband. He was wearing a sweater, even though it was perfectly mild. 
They stayed there a while and then he went to bed before her. I'm just going to stay out here for a while. Eduardo seemed fine with that and sloped off after planting a small kiss on the top of her head. She stepped out with her glass of wine and walked among the moonlit vines. She stared at a clear sky full of stars. There was absolutely nothing wrong with this life, but she felt inside her a craving for other things, other lives, other possibilities. She felt like she was still in the air, not ready to land. Maybe she was more like Hugo Lefebvre than she had realized. Maybe she could flick through lives as easily as flicking pages. She gulped the rest of the wine, knowing there would be no hangover. Earth and wood, she said to herself. She closed her eyes. It wasn't long now, not long at all. She just stood there and waited to disappear. Of course, when you have that many options, it's difficult to be satisfied and committed to one life. The many lives of Nora Seed. Nora came to understand something, something Hugo had never fully explained to her in that kitchen in the Svalbard. You didn't have to enjoy every aspect of each life to keep having the option of experiencing them. You just had to never give up on the idea that there would be a life somewhere that could be enjoyed. Equally, enjoying a life didn't mean you stayed in that life. You only stayed in a life forever if you couldn't imagine a better one. And yet, paradoxically, the more lives you tried, the easier it became to think of something better, as the imagination broadened a bit more with every new life she sampled. So, in time, and with Mrs. Elm's assistance, Nora took lots of books from the shelves and ended up having a taste of lots of different lives in her search for the right one. She learned that undoing regrets was really a way of making wishes come true. There was almost any life she was living in one universe after all. In one life, she had quite a solitary time in Paris and taught English in a college in Montparnasse and cycled by the Seine and read lots of books on park benches. In another, she was a yoga teacher with the neck mobility of an owl. In one life, she kept up swimming but had never tried to pursue the Olympics. She just did it for fun. In that life, she was a lifeguard in the beach resort of Sitges near Barcelona, was fluent in both Catalan and Spanish, and had a hilarious best friend called Gabriela who taught her how to surf and who she shared an apartment with five minutes from the beach. There was one existence where Nora had kept up the fiction writing she had occasionally toyed with at university and was now a published author. Her novel, The Shape of Regret, received rave reviews and was shortlisted for a major literary award. In that life, she had lunch in a disappointingly banal Soho members club with two affable, easygoing producers from Magic Lantern Productions who wanted to option it for film. She ended up choking on a piece of flatbread and knocking her red wine over one of the producer's trousers and messing up the whole meeting. In one life, she had a teenage son called Henry, who she never met properly because he kept slamming doors in her face. In one life, she was a concert pianist, currently on tour in Scandinavia, playing night after night to besotted crowds and fading into the midnight library during one disastrous rendition of Chopin's Piano Concerto No. 2 at Finlandia Hall in Helsinki. In one life, she only ate toast. In one life, she went to Oxford and became a lecturer in philosophy at St. Catherine's College and lived by herself in a fine Georgian townhouse in a genteel row amid an environment of respectable calm. In another life, Nora was a sea of emotions, she felt everything deeply and directly, every joy and every sorrow. A single moment could contain both intense pleasure and intense pain, as if both were dependent on each other, like a pendulum in motion. A simple walk outside and she could feel a heavy sadness simply because the sun had slipped behind a cloud. Yet, conversely, meeting a dog who was clearly grateful for her attention caused her to feel so exultant that she felt she could melt into the pavement with sheer bliss. In that life, she had a book of Emily Dickinson poems beside her bed, and she had a playlist called Extreme States of Euphoria, and another one called The Glue to Fix Me When I Am Broke. Cool name for a playlist. In one life, she was a travel vlogger who had 1,750,000 YouTube subscribers and almost as many people following her on Instagram. And her most popular video was one where she fell off a gondola in Venice. 
She also had one about Rome called Aromatherapy. In one life, she was a single parent to a baby that literally wouldn't sleep. In one life, she ran the showbiz column in a tabloid newspaper and did stories about Ryan Bailey's relationships. In one life, she was a picture editor at the National Geographic. In one life, she was a successful eco-architect who lived a carbon-neutral existence in a self-designed bungalow that harvested rainwater and ran on solar power. In one life, she was an aid worker in Botswana. In one life, a cat sitter. In one life, a volunteer in a homeless shelter. In one life, she was sleeping on her only friend's sofa. In one life, she taught music in Montreal. In one life, she spent all day arguing with people she didn't know on Twitter and ended a fair proportion of her tweets by saying, do better, while secretly realizing she was telling herself to do that. In one life, she had no social media accounts. In one life, she'd never drunk alcohol. In one life, she was a chess champion and currently visiting Ukraine for a tournament. In one life, she was married to a major royal and hated every minute. In one life, her Facebook and Instagram only contained codes from Romy and Lotso. In one life, she was on her third husband and already bored. In one life, she was a vegan powerlifter. In one life, she was traveling around South America and caught up in an earthquake in Chile. In one life, she had a friend called Becky who said, Oh, what larks, whenever anything good was happening. In one life, she met Hugo again, diving off the Corsican coast, and they talked quantum mechanics and got drunk together at a beachside bar until Hugo slipped away out of that life mid-sentence. So Nora was left talking to a blank Hugo who was trying to remember her name. In some lives, Nora attracted a lot of attention. In some lives, she attracted none. In some lives, she was rich. In some lives, she was poor. In some lives, she was healthy. In some lives, she couldn't climb the stairs without getting out of breath. In some lives, she was in a relationship. In others, was solo. In many, she was somewhere in between. Like situationships. Very common these days. In some lives, she was a mother, but in most, she wasn't. She had been a rock star, an Olympian, a music teacher, a primary school teacher, a professor, a CEO, a PA, a chef, a glaciologist, a climatologist, an acrobat, a tree planter, an audit manager, a hairdresser, a professional dog walker, an office clerk, a software developer, a receptionist, a hotel cleaner, a politician, a lawyer, a shoplifter, a head of an ocean protection charity, a shop worker again, a waitress, a first line supervisor, a glass blower, and a thousand other things. She'd had horrendous commutes in cars, on buses, in trains, on ferries, on bikes, on foot. She'd had emails and emails and emails. She'd had a 53-year-old boss with halitosis touch her leg under the table and takes her a photo of his penis. <laughs> what the fuck? She'd had colleagues who lied about her and colleagues who loved her and mainly colleagues who were entirely indifferent. In many lives, she chose not to work and in some, she didn't choose not to work but still couldn't find any. In some lives, she smashed through the glass ceiling and in some, she just polished it. She had been excessively over and underqualified. She had slept brilliantly and terribly. In some lives, she was on antidepressants, and in others, she didn't even take ibuprofen for a headache. In some lives, she was a physically healthy hypochondriac, and in some, a seriously ill hypochondriac, and in most, she wasn't a hypochondriac at all. There was a life where she had chronic fatigue, a life where she had cancer, a life where she suffered a herniated disc, and broken her ribs in a car accident. There had, in short, been a lot of lives. And among those lives, she had laughed and cried and felt calm and terrified and everything in between. And between these lives, she always saw Mrs. Elm in the library. And at first, it seemed that the more lives she experienced, the fewer problems there seemed to be with the transfer. The library never felt like it was on the blink of crumbling or falling apart or at risk of disappearing completely. The lights didn't even flicker through many of the changeovers. It was as though she had reached some state of acceptance about life. And if there was a bad experience, there wouldn't only be a bad experience. 
She realized that she hadn't tried to end her life because she was miserable, but because she had managed to convince herself that there was no way out of her misery. That, she supposed, was the basis of depression as well as the difference between fear and despair. Fear was when you wandered into a cellar and worried that the door would close shut. Despair was when the door closed and locked behind you. But with every life, she saw that metaphorical door widen a little further as she grew better at using her imaginations. Sometimes she wasn't alive for less than a minute, while in others she was there for days or weeks. It seemed the more lives she lived, the harder it was to feel at home anywhere. The trouble was that eventually Nora began to lose any sense of who she was, like a whispered word passed around from ear to ear. Even her name began to sound like just a noise, signifying nothing. It's not working, she told Hugo in her last proper conversation with him in that beach bar in Kariska. It's not fun anymore. I'm not you. I need somewhere to stay. But the ground is never stable. The fun is in the jumping, mon ami. But what if it's in the landing? And that was the moment he had returned to his purgatorial video store. I'm sorry, his other self said as he sipped his wine and the sunset behind him. I've forgotten your name. Don't worry, she said. So have I, as she too faded away like the sun that had just been swallowed by the horizon. Mrs. Elm? Yeah, Nora, what's the matter? It's dark. I had noticed. That's not a good sign, is it? No, said Mrs. Elm, sounding flustered. You know perfectly well it's not a good sign. I can't go on. You always say that. I have run out of lives. I have been everything. And yet I always end up back here. There's always something that stops my enjoyment. Always. I feel ungrateful. Well, you shouldn't. And you haven't run out of anything. Mrs. Elm paused to sigh. Did you know that every time you choose a book, it never returns to the shelves? Yes. Which is why you can never go back into a life you have tried. There always needs to be some variation on a theme. In the Midnight Library, you can't take the same book out twice. I don't follow. Well, even in the dark, you know these shelves are as full as the last time you looked. Feel them if you like. Nora didn't feel them. Yeah, I know they are. They're exactly as full as they were when you first arrived here, aren't they? I don't. That means there are still as many possible lives out there for you as there ever were. An infinite number, in fact. You can never run out of possibilities. But you can run out of wanting them. Oh, Nora. Oh, what? There was a pause in the darkness. Nora pressed the small light on her watch just to check. Midnight. I think, Mrs. Elm said eventually, if I may say so without being rude, I think you might have lost your way a little bit. Isn't that why I came to the Midnight Library in the first place? Because I had lost my way? Well, yes. But now you are lost within your lostness, which is to say very lost indeed. You're not going to find the way you want to live like this. What if there was never a way? What if I am trapped? As long as there are still books on the shelves, you are never trapped. Every book is a potential escape. I just don't understand life, sulked Nora. You don't have to understand life. You just have to live it. Nora shook her head. This was a bit too much for a philosophy graduate to take. But I don't want to be like this, Nora told her. I don't want to be like Hugo. I don't want to keep flickering between lives forever. All right, then you need to listen carefully to me. Now, do you want my advice or don't you? Well, yeah, of course. It feels a little late, but yes, Mrs. Elm. I would be very grateful for your advice on this. Right, well, I think you have reached the point where you can't see the wood for the trees. I'm not quite sure what you mean. You are right to think of these lives like a piano where you're playing tunes that aren't really you. You are forgetting who you are. In becoming everyone, you are becoming no one. You are forgetting your root life. 
You're forgetting what worked for you and what didn't. You're forgetting your regrets. I've been through my regrets. No, not all of them. Well, not every single minor one, no, obviously. You need to look at the book of regrets again. How can I do that in the pitch dark? Because you already know the whole book. Because it's inside you. Just as... Just as I am. She remembered the land telling her she had seen Mrs. Elm near the care home. She thought about telling her this, but decided against it. Right. We only know what we perceive. Everything we experience is ultimately just our perception of it. It's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see. You know through? Of course, if you do. The thing is, I don't know what I regret anymore. Okay, well, let's see. You say that I am just a perception. Then, why did you perceive me? Why am I, Mrs. Elm, the person you see? I don't know, because you were someone I trusted. You were kind to me. Kindness is a strong force. And rare. You might be looking in the wrong places. Maybe. The dark was punctured by the slow rising glow of the light bulbs all around the library. So where else in your root life have you felt that? Kindness. Nora remembered the night Ash knocked on her door, maybe lifting a dead cat off the road and carrying it in the rain around to her flat's tiny back garden and then burying it on her behalf because she was sobbing drunkenly with grief wasn't the most archetypal romantic thing in the world, but it certainly qualified as kind. To take 40 minutes out of your run and help someone in need while only accepting a glass of water in return. She hadn't really been able to appreciate that kindness in that time. Her grief and despair had been too strong, but now she thought about it, it had really been quite remarkable. I think I know, she said. It was right there in front of me, the night before I tried to kill myself. Yesterday evening, you mean? I suppose, yes. Ash, the surgeon, the one who found Volts, who once asked me out for coffee, years ago. When I was with Dan, I'd say no, well, because I was with Dan, but what if I hadn't been? What if I had broken up with Dan and gone on that coffee date and had dared on a Saturday with all the shop watching to say yes to a coffee? Because there must be a life in which I was single in that moment and where I said what I wanted to say. Where I said, yes, I would like to go for a coffee sometime, Ash. That would be lovely. Where I picked Ash. I'd like to have a go at that life. Where would that have taken me? And in the dark, she heard the familiar sound of the shelves beginning to move. Slowly with a creak, then faster, smoother, until Mrs. Elm spotted the book, The Life in Question. Right there. Okay, we're done with this part now. I had a cold that it had affected my voice, so I couldn't record this part earlier. But I'm telling you, we're finishing this book in the next part. Don't forget to like and subscribe. See you then.